I almost fell at home. <laughs> you just got to pick the beat up quite a bit, okay? Oh, that was great. Uh, I like that. I like that. All righty, turn with me to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. And um, we are going to... Let me see. Do I need to put this thing on? All righty. Titus chapter 3, and um, as you turn there, let, uh, let us just, let's just give thanks. Father, we are so thankful this evening for this time of um, fellowship we can enjoy together this week. We thank you, God, that you are faithful and you have called us into the fellowship of your Son. We are so eternally thankful for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for our sins and was buried and rose again, and that we can have life, eternal life, in Him, and we can have a blessed hope because of him and the security we enjoy um, being secure in your son. And we just thank you that you have made us accepted in the beloved. And um, we thank you for all these things. We thank you for this week of conference. We thank you for the, the ministry of, the very, uh, of, of everyone that's involved here. And um, we thank you for the edification that we received this week through perfected saints. And we praise you and we thank you for these things by Christ Jesus alone. Amen. So uh, my, my, t- my, my title this evening that I'm going to teach on is Grace Age Service. Grace, Grace Age Service. And this week, the theme was the four faithful sayings of the Apostle Paul. And we had Alex on Monday night starting off with Grace, Grace Age Salvation, looking at Paul's salvation and the pattern of Paul's salvation and commissioning and Paul being our pattern and that we follow. And, on, and Tom on Tuesday night did Grace Age Sanctification and through godly edifying and the value for the life that is now and, and which is to come. And, uh, and, and, uh, and on, um, Rick last night did a great job and great shape. No, no, not that I mean that the other guys did not do a great job, okay? So, Tom, Alex, you did a great job, okay? And Rick last night did Grace Age Suffering, uh, talking about um, uh, our, our faithfulness and reward in the face of difficulties and oppositions. And then tonight, my, uh, the, my, my, my message is grace, there's a fourth faithful saying, grace, age, service. And, um, and I'm so thankful, just, just, just thinking about it, that, that and everything that we have from God, in, from, from our eternal salvation, from, from our, uh, our salvation uh, and being saved, God has not just given us the gift of eternal life, but God has equipped us for every detail of our life, our walk, our life here, and for that which is to come. And whatever we do here impacts, impacts our eternal destiny. And so I'm so thankful for God's complete supply. Nothing is up to us to do. That's the only thing that is required of us, and I'm going to hopefully bring over to you tonight, is to believe what God said in His Word. Okay, and he's equipped us, and there's a house of doctrine that he's, he's furnished us with from Romans to Philemon to for us to do that and understand. We don't have to sit and wonder, what does God want me to do? What, how can I be of service for him? It is there in the book. Okay, and so let, let's go read there. Uh, Titus chapter 3, uh, verse 1 says, But there, uh, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lust and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And if I had Brian Ross's t-shirt on now, somebody give me an amen. Amen. N- not me, but, you know, for the scriptures of the Word of God, yeah. Uh, Brian Ross is very, he wants the amen, you know, for him, but. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> Verse 8. 
This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such as uh, is subverted and sinneth being condemned of himself. When I shall send Artemis unto thee, and Antichicus, be diligent to come unto me to Nicopolis, where I have determined there to winter. Bring Zenos the lawyer and Apollos, and, and Apollos on the journey diligently, that nothing be wanting unto them. And let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary users, that they be not unfruitful. All that are with me salute thee. Greet them that love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. And so, uh, what a wonderful way, uh, what instruction Paul gives to Titus here. And, and by inspiration, these, these words are in, inspired and preserved for you and I as the members of the body of Christ today and for the church. And we can take, and, uh, take some information out here and, and, and receive instruction and admonition, uh, instruction here from God's word regarding um, maintaining good works. He's, he's just told him about all the things, about uh, you know, the, the, the qualifications of the ministers and uh, the, the women's roles, the men's roles, and children and masters and servants and all these things. And now he says, you know, and then he closes this off and he says, verse 8 says, this is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto Men, okay? And so, if I have to ask you this evening, show by hand, who of you guys would like to have a life in this grace age service that wants to maintain good works? Who wants to do good works? And I don't think there's a hand that will not go up here tonight. We all want to do good works, okay? And I think, and I think there is a, not I think, I believe there is a very thin line between when it's a good work of my own will and my own ability, when I do it, versus when it is Christ's life living through me. Okay? And so Paul is not at all saying, and we're going to look at this to this evening, Paul is not saying they of their own self need to maintain good works. The issue is the doctrine that we continuously need to teach and preach. And if they believe that, it will work in them effectually and produce the good works. Okay, that's the issue here. Okay, it's not what we do. It's not what we maintain. It's what God's word instructs us to believe. It's always going to come down to the just shall live by faith. What God's word says. Okay, and so Paul says here that you know uh, uh, the necess- so, so so I'm going to talk about the the necess- necessity and motivation for maintaining good works over a believer's lifetime. Okay, and as we challenge you in this last message. This evening, okay, and so, um, so grace age service, service, sorry, is only by grace through Christ. There's no other way that you can do be a service to God outside of Christ. It has to be in Christ. It has to be in what God has furnished us with, and what is wrought in us, what is worked in us. Okay, there is much more to grace than just eternal salvation. There is the life and the walk that is the here and now. And that life and walk and what we believe here and what we respond to the truth of God's word now will impact. Now, not an eternal destiny, but impact where we live eternally. Okay? And some of the men talked about some of those things already. Okay? It's more than just believing a bunch of facts. I've seen a many, many, many grace believers. And, I've, you know, and, 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 and I, I almost want to say I was there. When I got to the information of understanding the difference between law and grace, between prophecy and mystery, the difference between Paul and the twelve, and it's, a, it's good information, and, and it shows you the distinctions. But I tell you what, it was more about me accumulating knowledge so that I can point fingers at somebody else and say where they fail. Okay? And so knowledge does what? It puffs us up. So knowledge, in the absence of wisdom and spiritual understanding, is... I would say a dangerous thing. 
Okay? It's not about just learning a bunch of facts. And I know it's nice to learn these things. Oh, I, you, we find out a new things like, you know, and, and some new things. And oh, this is great. Paul is our apostle. And it's fantastic. But it's more than that. What, what God gives us in Christ Jesus through the revelation, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery is the walk, is the life. It's the, it's the complete package. And it furnishes for us for every detail. And that's why we need to get our nose into the book. And we need to read and understand what God has made us to be in Christ. Because that is going to be the motivation for service. Because it's not I that's going to do it, it's Christ. Okay? You hear people say, I, I, I. And I sometimes catch myself, I. You know what, I need to take I out of the sentence. Because it's what God is doing. God is faithful. God is working. His word is alive. It works in me. And so Paul says here in in Titus chapter 3, he says, says, this is a faithful saying. A faithful saying is something trustworthy, true, tested, and worth repeating. It needs to be preached consistently and continuously. It's one of those faithful sayings. Okay? Okay? And it means, he says, and, and he says, this is the faithful saying, and verse 8 says, And these things I will that thou affirm constantly. So he says to, to, to Timothy, these things, what things is he talking about? Just the verse before it? I think, and it's my opinion, not, not my opinion, I think it's everything that is written to Titus from chapter 1 right through. And as a matter of fact, for the body of Christ, you and I need to take everything from Romans to Philemon and throw it in the package. These things, it's the doctrine. That he's talking about. And you need to constantly affirm it. And, and, and it's these things is a doctrine of the gospel of, God, of, of grace. And he says affirm constantly. It was Titus' job. It was Titus' function. As a leader. As a pastor. As a bishop. In the office of a bishop. It was his job. And it was Timothy's. And, and it was ours too. To preach the word. To be instant in season. What? Out of season. And to affirm these things constantly, not to quit bringing the attention to it. It's so easy to quit preaching the doctrine. Because when you want to fill your church, you can't preach too much doctrine. You need to teach more to each and years, right? You need to preach more messages that's going to fe- make, feel people, make, make people feel a little nice about themselves. That's how you're going to fill the church. So you, what do you do? And I've been there, done that. I got the t-shirt. Where we started in a church, I'm telling you, I'm not going to mention names. They'll listen to the message. They'll know exactly what I'm talking about. We started and we were so excited when I got into Right Division. And we had this church with about 50, 60 people. And it was the fantastic, most, it was a wonderful thing to come to understand that the doctrines of grace, the revelation of the mystery, to understand these things. And then we said, well, we need to move, and we build ourselves a big church. And we moved up, and we built a big church in a, in a place where everybody could see us. And you know what's the, what was the, one of the first things that went? The doctrine. It gets watered down a little bit, because now we get all these people in. No, no, he says, these things, the doctrine, we need to affirm Constantly. That means not to quit bringing attention to it. We need to insist on the doctrine. Insist on teaching it. That word there, when he says there, that these things that will, uh, 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 these things I will that thou affirm constantly. Go with me to Acts chapter 12 quickly. Acts chapter 12. In Acts chapter 12, Peter was in prison. And, he's, and, and, and by midnight, the, the doors open and all these things. And the angel is assisting him and escorting him out there. In Acts chapter 12, and, and um, let's go read there, verse 11. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel, and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod, and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked on the door of the gate, a damsel came to, uh, to hearken, named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the door. And imagine that. They know Peter's in prison. She comes in and she hears the door and, and outside the door says, Hey, open the door, it's Peter. Or not even, she, maybe not even said it's Peter. She recognized his voice. 
And she's like so excited. And she gets in. She says, Peter's at the door. Okay, look at this now. He says, and, 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 and when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the, ga- the gate for gladness. I mean, she's, the poor guy is still standing out there. She's running in there to tell everybody, yeah, he's here, he's here. Okay. And the guy's like, you know, where's the guards? They're going to come get me, you know. And he's standing outside the door, yeah. And, said, and, and, and they said, on, and she, 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 she oh, sorry, and when she, she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told Peter, and told how Peter stood before the door. And verse 15 says, And they said unto her, Thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, It is his angel. So imagine now, she's coming in there. She says, Peter's at the gate. She says, You crazy girl. Sit down, you know. No, no, that's really, it is Peter. No, you're crazy girl. Be quiet. You're mad, man. No, 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 it is Peter. She constantly insisted that it is, and affirmed it is Peter. And we know the rest of the story, right? So she didn't quit. She insisted it eat to be so. So if in Titus chapter 3 verse 8 says, This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that tells me we need to become insistent that it is so, the Scriptures. It is so, the doctrine. And you know, when people don't want to hear it, and say, No, you're crazy. Keep on preaching it. Do not quit preaching it. Do not forsake the doctrine. Do not leave it. They're going to say you're crazy. Guess what? Constantly affirm it. Constantly affirm it. There's sufferings that comes with that, right? When you constantly affirm those things. It says constantly affirm it. And what you do is when you constantly affirm it, you bring them into remembrance. You bring them into remembrance. Go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul is talking to Timothy. And, you know, Timothy is here. He's mindful of his tears. And Timothy is... T- t- Timothy is at a difficult place here. And he says, um, verse 6 is, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance, first, second, second Timothy chapter 1 verse 6, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by putting out of my hands. So what is Paul doing to Timothy? He's, he's affirming, he's consistently affirming with him in this letter. He's telling him, I, I'm, I'm reminding you of the doctrine. I don't mind of you of what we've put in you. And yeah, I don't see as the issue of so much Paul laying his hands on him. It's the issue of Paul putting his hands on him. That means the ministry he invested into the life of Timothy and the doctrine that he taught him and established him in. He says, stir that thing up. I want to remind you. Okay. It's a similar, it's a similar thing of you constantly affirming it. Remind him of that. Okay, refresh his memory, and we need to refresh our memories on a consistent basis on what the doctrine says. And that's in, that is important for us to maintain good works. We're going to see now a little bit about that, why we say that. Okay, how often do we need to be reminded of things? Sometimes when our affection and our attention goes to other places, we tend to forget what the Word of God says, Right? And it's our job that preach the word. And, our part, and I'm not just talking about somebody standing on a pulpit and preaching it. I'm talking about somebody that's that the head of a home, a mother with her children, whoever, whatever shape of your ministry is. To constantly affirm. To put them into remembrance. Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse um, 6. He says, if I put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good man of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and good doctrine, wherein to thou hast attained. So he's basically telling Timothy, you know, you'll be a good minister. You'll be a good minister of Jesus Christ if you put the bread in remembrance of these things because you nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, wherein to thou hast attained. Because that's what you do. When you are built up in the doctrine and, 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 and you nourish with the word of God, what do you do? Do you forsake talking about it or do you continuously talk about this you continuously affirm that it is so do you continuously put them in remembrance of the doctrine that's what we do right and he says we need to constantly affirm this put them in remembrance okay and we're going to do that by sound doctrine go back with me to titus chapter 3 this is the faithful saying and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. You know, that they that believed in God might be careful. Who's they? Who's they that believe in God? 
us, the body of Christ. Right? We believe in God, right? And so he says, you remind those, the body of Christ, to be careful to maintain good works. Now, I like the way that he says that they're to be careful. When are you careful about stuff? That means, I, I don't know who was spoke about this. I think it was a Tom that says, full of care. When you talk about be careful for nothing, or somebody, somebody was preaching on that. And they used the, 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 the definition of careful being full of care, to be anxious, to be watchful, to be cautious, to giving good heed, to be careful to make, in, in, in the sense here of maintaining good works, filled with care or attentiveness, exposing to concern. So the Bible uses the word careful in two ways in our English Bible. In, in, in Philipp, uh, Philipp, uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, Be careful for nothing but in, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your request known unto God, right? That means do not be anxious, do not have to be full of care about anything, but what you need to do is do what? By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, right? So that's, that careful is a negative thing, but in this sense here, where Paul is using this, is to be, is the positive sense of it, in, it says, be full of care to maintain good works. Make it your ambition, make it your job, make it your, give it your full attention and give heed to the doctrine, and so that you can maintain good works. Okay? Be careful about that. So that tells me, as a grace believer, you know what? This idea of me, we saved by grace, I just get God's full gift, and, and I'm furnished unto all, uh, 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 I'm not sorry, uh, I have the, 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 the complete gift, I'm accepting the beloved, and now I can sit back, put my feet up, and enjoy the rest of my life, because I have this wonderful positional security in Christ. Now I don't have to be careful about doing good works. No, the very reason we're going to see just now why God saved us is unto good works. Works. And it's not for us to sit back and just live our life with the knowledge of, hey, I have eternal security, so forget it. I'm out of here and I'm just going to leave it for some other guys to do. You understand what I'm saying? And so, so we have to be, that means we need to be full of care about that. And it's not just Timothy and Titus that needs to be full of care. No, they need to preach to the body, to them that believe in God, to be careful about that. That includes all of us. How careful are you about maintaining good works? Now, if you're careful about maintaining good works because you want to do it as a work of your flesh, quit being careful about that. But be careful about the doctrine and the truth of God's Word that works in you effectually and let it work. Because let me tell you something, you're going to figure out very quickly what is a work of God and what is a work of yours. You know it. Because it will be based on the doctrine. It will be based on the truth of God's word. It works in us. Do you get that? But for you to do that, you need to be in, we need to be in the book. I was just saying last Sunday at our assembly, you know, I said, you know what? Because we don't tend to spend much time in reading our Bibles, much time in, 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 in reading and, and, and giving attention to it. You know, it's just something, it's lie there and Sunday we go to church. Where's my Bible? Let me grab it. Take it up there and we follow the preacher. Oh, that's just great message, wonderful. And we really enjoyed that, Pastor. That was a oh, that was a good message. You get home, put the Bible down there, and just leave it alone. Next week we grab it again. Now what we need to do is get our nose into the book. And I'm leaving my I've just completely lost my thought now. It comes when you're the other side of 50 now, but anyway. So you have to read God. No, can you believe it? I guess you can. But you've got to read God's Word and just not leave it there and let it sit there because what we need... Well, that's the point. I'm getting, I'm getting it back. I'm getting it back. <laughs> All right. I get it. I get it. Now that's gone again. No, I'm just, uh, <laughs> I'm just joking. Uh, um, so, so, you know, so, so, so I have found in the ministry, I have found in the work of the ministry that those people that so-called do good works and the, your biggest critics and your biggest complainers and the people that always have issues and problems and the guys that's first running to you and said, you should have used this word instead of that word. You didn't quite say it correctly. Those guys are the most unspiritual people and carnal people because they're so puffed up with their own knowledge. They don't have wisdom and spiritual understanding. The spiritual people that reads the word of God and it works in them effectually is not critical of everybody. 
So if you're a critic all the time criticizing everybody and knows better, that to me is a sign of your carnality. Not a sign of your spirituality. Not a sign of God's word working in you. Because if it's working in you, you will not be this critic. You will learn to be long-suffering and kind and tender-hearted. And apt to teach. And not strive. Good works is not striving. It's not to, it's not to, 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 to entertain foolish questions and, and get on with all that stuff. You know, there's so many distractions in the work of the ministry. And we get our cause off caught up so instead of maintaining good works, what we like to entertain to be careful about is stuff that's got no impact on eternal in eternity. He says, be careful to maintain good works. Okay? We have to be very attentive to the instruction to maintain good works. That word, now the next part of that verse is, and we say, this is a faithful saying, and these things, these things will I that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. When you maintain something, it's to hold it, to preserve or to keep it in, any, in a particular state or condition. That's what the word maintain means. It's when you have a fire in a furnace and you want to keep the heat, you've got to keep do what? Stoking it, stoking it to keep that heat, to maintain the heat. Because as soon as you're not stoking it, you know, the old, I don't know much about trains and stuff, but I can just imagine, you know, if that old steam liners, and if you, can, if you don't keep on putting coal into that thing, it's going to lose some oomph. And so when you're going to get to this little bit wet uphill, you're going to have to stoke that thing and make sure that you've got the most pressure you can get, the most heat you can get, you can create the pressure so that you can go uphill. And so this is, this is the idea of maintaining good works, is to keep the pressure on it, to keep stoking that fire, to keep it and to hold it, not to lose or surrender, to continue, not to suffer, to cease, but to keep it up. Keep pressing toward the mark for the price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Keep on pressing. Keep on pressing. That's what maintain good works means. Not to quit. And to do the maintain, it says we need to be ready to do so. Look at Titus chapter 3, uh, verse 1. He says, but put them, in, put, them in, uh, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and to powers. To... to, to um, to obey magistrate, to be ready to every good work. So how are you going to be ready? You know? My daughter's not going to listen to this, so I can talk about her now. <laughs> so the guys that's got contact with her, don't talk to her, tell her that I'm telling this. Otherwise, I'm in trouble. She's, she's got a car. She's not maintaining the car. And she drives over the state all the time. And I'm like, did you do the oil change? No, not yet. Well, you need to do the oil change. Did you check the tire pressure? No, not yet. You, you, why are you bothering me? No, I, maintain it. Because when you're going to need it, you, it's going to fail you. And it happened a little while ago. She was not keeping up. Or at, uh, for What I mean for her to maintain a car is to come to me and say, Dad, would you look over my car for me, please? That's the responsibility. You know, you laugh, but you know, it's a, just your car standing there in the driveway. Let me look at it for you. She calls me, says the thing doesn't want to break right. You know, I said, well, did you check it? You know, when last you do the maintenance? When last you do the service? Well, uh, so I get the. I said, she gets. She, I don't know how many miles she had to get. She gets home. She's. I next morning I get out of the car. I do the back wheel, and the back wheel is doing this. So I take the, the wheels off and the whole, you know, it's one of those sealed um, uh, uh, bearings unit. And, 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 and it's completely, the, 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 the bearing is disintegrated. She says, I heard the car make a little funny noise, but you know. <laughs> I'm like, if you maintain it and if you keep up with it, it's ready to go. You can jump in at any time. And the same principle is when we maintain what God is working in us, the good works. We're ready to go. We're ready for every good work. Because we are equipped and we've done the maintenance in our life, as you will, of our Christian life. By putting the word in there and believing it as it's working and we'll be ready for it. 
How much maintenance do you put in your life as a believer? We come to conference. We all fired up. We go home, and but guess what happens? Life happens. When we wait for the next conference, so we can get a little something to stoke us up and heat up the fire again. You understand what I'm saying? Be careful to maintain good works. Okay? Paul says, you know, we need to, Paul talks about, look in Titus chapter 2, verse 14. I'm not going to go through, because we'll possibly get back to this passage just now. He says, who, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good work. Zealous means to be warmly engaged, to be enthusiastic, to be fervent in spirit, hot in pursuit. Zealous of good works. That's why God saved, you know. That's what He's forming in us. That he, that's why Christ gave Himself for us, that He might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto Himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. That's the design and the finished work of Christ on the cross of Calvary in the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. That's what he wants of us. Paul, in his life, I see him continuously practicing what he's preaching to Timothy here, or to Titus here, in Second Timothy chapter four. Second Timothy chapter four, verse six. So top Timothy, uh, the Paul is at the place where he's. Death is a door. It's a death's door. He's going to be killed. At the end of his ministry, he says, "For I am now ready." Verse six. He says, "For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith." That sounds to me like somebody that maintained, was careful to maintain good works. Careful and ready for every good work. He says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. So there is a reward. Brother Ed, with the power, okay, Guys, got that fire, fire. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> An audience of one went mad. Okay, <clears throat> there's a reward. Because he, he kept the faith. He kept on maintaining. He, he kept the word of God in him, and he, and, 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 and and he and, and he was motivated by that. I want to say this, and I want. I hope it doesn't come across. And it's not perceived wrongly. But my motivation to maintain good works is not to get a reward. My motivation is not the reward. My motivation is the word of Christ that works in me. There is a reward. I'm going to get a reward. But I'm not doing what I'm doing so that I can get a reward and can brag about it at the end of the day. I'm doing it because of God's love constraining me, take holding of me, and working in me. I'm doing it because it is what I am instructed to do. You understand what I'm saying? There's a very fine line there, but it could be easily, because we could start spending our life as believers just having rewards in mind, and, 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 and it becomes then a performance-based system. It's not a thing that's functioning on the finished work of God working in us because it's motivating me to that. It's not I that's motivated by the reward, but the reward is a result of God's Word motivating me and the life of Christ working in me effectually to that point. Paul says in Rome, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 quickly.
Verse 14 says, chapter 5, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge. If one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, and they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. He didn't say, you know, the love of Christ constraineth us, because there's a reward at the end of the day for us. No, it's because of the life of Christ. He says, and that he died for all, and they which live should not answer, live unto, himself, uh, to, uh, unto themselves, but unto him which died and rose for them. That's why Paul says in Romans chapter 12, I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God that you present your body, what? A living sacrifice unto God, which is your what? Reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is a good and acceptable, perfect what? Will of God. You do it because you're instructed from God's Word. And when you read that passage and you believe it, it starts working in you and produce the life. And there's a reward at the end of that. And so we need to be, we need to maintain, and that was just a little side note on this. Paul says, see then you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time. Why? Because the days are evil. As grace believers, as believers, members of the body of Christ, we not need to walk in wisdom to them that are without redeeming the time. The days are evil. And for that reason, we need to be careful to maintain good works. Because it's profitable for all men. It's profitable for men. Look at Romans chapter 13, if you will. Romans chapter 13. In Romans chapter 13, verse 11, Paul says to the Romans, and, that knowing that, uh, and, and knowing the time that now is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than, we, than when we believed. Isn't that true? <laughs> Every time you're going to read it, it's going to be nearer, right? The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us... Put on the armor of light. Let us, let us walk honestly as in the day. Not in rioting and drunkenness. Not in chambering and wantonness. Not in strife and envying. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. And make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust of it. How do you put on the Lord Jesus Christ? And the way that you put on the Lord Jesus Christ is by the renewing of your mind. Because of God's words working in you that you believe it, you put off the old man and do it. Guess what's the next thing you do? You put on the new man, which after God has created in righteousness. It is necessary for the rest of our lives as believers to maintain good works. And good works, as I said to you before, is the result of the doctrine working in us. It's a result of the design of God's Word, as the way that He lays it out for us in our foundational truth, in, 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 in the body life truth, and the, the ultimate glorification of it. And what we came out to the end of the day, as this, as this doctrine works on us, we come to the conclusion, it's no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, you guys know the verse. We are saved unto good works. To maintain good works, our motivation and necessity to maintain that is, is that the fact is that God says He has saved us unto good works. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Everybody is still awake? Everybody still here? That's good. Everybody going to understand the accent? You, you, can, you guys figured out my accent is not as thick as it was? I had to do it, otherwise nobody knows what I'm talking about. I used to get people after the services, man, oh, that was a great message. I love your accent. <laughs> what is it that you like about the message? The accent? <laughs> In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are His 
workmanship created in Christ Jesus to what intent? Unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should what? Walk in them. So we are saved. We are God's workmanship created what? In Christ Jesus unto good works. If we are not God's workmanship unto good works, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus, the only place where you can be unto good works. You can't do it without Christ living in us. We have to be in Christ for it to be acceptable of God. God accepts no man's good works. No man's good works if it's not in Christ. If it's not Christ working in us, and living in us, and we live it by the faith of the Son of God who loved us and gave Himself for us, it is unacceptable to God. And the only way it can be acceptable is a good work to God and, 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 and received and rewarded if it is by the faith of the Son of God that's now living in us. I know a lot of people that are full of good works. But they're just good works. Morally good works. They have no eternal value. And the only way they can have eternal value if it is based on the life of Christ. And it's lived by the faith of the Son of God who loved us and gave Himself for us. It's Him working, not me. That's the beautiful thing about grace. God says, you know what? You can't save yourself. You can't pay for your eternal life. It's not by your works. I'm giving it to you freely by my grace. All you have to accept it is to trust, put your faith in the faith of Christ. And guess what? Now I'm not going to expect you to live by your own effort and your own ability. I'm only going to ask you to believe what I furnished you already worth and to take that and to put it on and to believe it and it will work in you effectually. I will do the work for you too. That's the wonderful thing about grace. Nothing is up to me except just believe what God's Word is saying. When we believe it, it works in us. We are, God, we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus. God made us. He created us in His Son, Christ Jesus. We were dead in trespasses and sins. But He has quickened us. He's made us alive in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. We'll go with me there quickly. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. I'm good on time. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. It says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I like the language. I like the grammar in that verse. Because it says there, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. That's what he made us to be in Christ. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So to me, that's a present continuous tense. So for every step to live in this life that now is and will be until we be taken out, it is, are become new. As the, old, as, as the outer man uh, uh, perish, the inward man is renewed day by day. It's all he's working. And the new way that we find ourselves and is this new, that is this creature that we are, as we find out in the fundamental doctrines of the book of Romans that Paul is giving to the church, he tells us about of your and my identity. And where is your and my identity? I honestly believe the lack of most believers and the life of motivating to be unto good work, to live life motivated by good and unto good works and maintaining good works is the lack of understanding our true identity in Christ. And I've dealt, as I've dealt with people and, 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 and I've, as, as I preached it, I preached on the identical the identification issues that we have in Christ, a new identity, this new creature that has made us to be in Christ Jesus, I have found more people being so, so come, come to me and say, that is what I'm lacking. Because if you don't know you died with Christ, and you don't know that you're buried with Him, and you don't know that you are risen with Him and now alive unto God, you don't know that. There's no way that you can reckon it as true. You're going to know that stuff first. And when you know it, now you can reckon it and account it. This is true. 
God's word says it. And now only are you able to yield your members, not as members of unrighteousness, but you yield your members as members of what? Righteousness. But without knowing and without reckoning, you cannot yield. That's what the doctrine is designed and the identification issues. We need to know who God has made us to be in Christ. My new identity, this new creature. Once I know it and I've reckoned it, I believe that now I can yield to it. And I do that by faith. It's all by faith. We live by faith and not by sight. Because it's His working in me. That's why Paul says, I beseech you now, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice unto God, which is your reasonable service. It is not at all unreasonable of God to expect you to do that, because He's furnished you to do so in His Son. Very reasonable. Because it's not up to you anymore. You need to know your new identity. When you knew identity, you know that you're justified, sanctified, and glorified. Not condemned. Now you can start living. Pleasing unto Him. 2 Corinthians 5, 5 says, Now He that hath wrought us for the self thing, same thing as God. The one that wrought us. He made us. Philippians 1, 16, saying, In confidence of everything that he which hath begun a good work in you will be formed until the day of Jesus Christ. Isn't it wonderful to know that God is faithful? Second Timothy chapter 3. In Second Timothy chapter 3. <coughs> verse 16 and 17 says, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable, profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be what? Perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. What is it that's going to furnish me unto all good works? The, the good works that I have to now maintain? It's the Word of God. It's the Scriptures. And it may, and, 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 and it, so that it's been given to us in all these areas and doctrine, reproof, and correction, instruction, righteousness, that we, the man of God, may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. What's going to furnish me unto all good works that I'm expected to maintain, to be careful to maintain? It's going to have to come, if this is what furnished me unto all good works, and I am to be careful to maintain it, how am I going to do that? I've got to get into the book. I've got to get into the Word of God and let it work in me. Because it's what's going to furnish me to do that. Because God's Word works in me. You guys know the verse I'm going to go to right now. Anybody? Anybody? 2.15, nope. Yeah. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. This church in Thessalonica, man, these guys got out. They work of faith, a labor of love, and, 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 and patience and hope. They just got out and get it done. Why? Why did they do that? Why did it become such an effective church? Because look at what he says in chapter 2, verse 13. He says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of God. Men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you, that what? It's going to, it's going to produce the, desire, the, the desired result that God purposed it to produce. When you believe it as the word of God. That's why we say, you know... <laughs> You start, it was a, man, you know, we get people come to our church, new people, and it's like, man, you guys do a lot of Bible verses. <laughs> because that's the only thing that, that's important. That's what we are called to preach. That's what's going to work. 
Now, if I, want my full, my ch- if I want my church full, and I want it really to burst at the seams and go build a few million dollar buildings and do all fancy stuff, I guess what? I need to close this book, put it down there, and tell stories and fables. And make them feel nice about themselves. And put up a nice music program, because that's going to just get him in the mood. And that's why we preach God's Word. And that's why we call to preach the Word, be instant in season, out of season, because that is what's going to work in us effectually that believes. Go with me to the book of Philemon. And Paul is writing to Philemon in, in chapter... Well, only chapter 1, right? How do you say Philemon chapter 1 verse 6, or do you say Philemon verse 6? Philemon verse 6? Philemon verse 6. You're never too old to learn anything. In the book of Philemon, he says, um, in verse 4, he says, I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints. By the way, he's praying for him, always in my prayers, he's remembering. He says also that, in his prayers, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual. How is the communication of Philemon's faith going to become effectual? Well, look at what it says there. The communication of faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. So when we acknowledge every good thing which is in us in Christ Jesus, we understand our identity issues and we get the fundamental doctrines uh, uh, down and we start getting the body doctrines down and we get it and we acknowledge every good thing which is in us in Christ Jesus, the communication of our faith becomes what? Effectual. Effectual. Because that's what God's Word is doing in us. And that's why it's important that we maintain these things. Because we are saved. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Look at Colossians chapter 1, if you will. In Colossians chapter 1, Paul is praying for the saints there, uh, 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 telling him what he's praying for them. By the way, when we pray for somebody, sometimes, you know what? If I, if I pray something, I'm praying for you. He says, oh, thank you. But I say, I'm praying for you that ye might be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Oh, are you praying for what? Now I'm really enticing him about what I'm praying for him about. I'm not just saying, oh, I'm praying for you. I could be praying anything. I could pray that the bus, next bus hits him and get out of here, you know. <laughs> well, he cares. You know what I'm praying for. But if I say, I'm praying for you. I'm praying that you will just hear the gospel and at least there's an opportunity to receive it. I pray that you would be under, come to understand God's word, right? I, and I tell you what I'm praying for. It's a little bit different, right? So Paul says, yeah, he's praying for them. He says, for this cause, verse 9, chapter 1, he says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of His will, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord, unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increase in the knowledge of God. That's what he's praying for them. But when they, before they become walk worthy of the Lord, unto all pleasing, and before they be fruitful unto all good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, he's first praying for them, that they might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Because when we walk worthy of the Lord, it is a result of knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Those three three together. Not just knowledge. Because knowledge puffs us up. Makes me superior to the other guy. But wisdom and understanding furnishes me unto all good works. Because I start to remember who I was and what God has made me to be. And I become wise about that stuff. And I get understanding about what God is doing in me through His finished work. And through the finished work of Christ. We're always going to have all sufficiency in Christ in all things. You're bound to every good work. He says in Ephesians chapter 2, which, he hath, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. It's what God expects of us, to walk in them. He saved us unto good works. And God has before ordained that we should what? Walk in them. That's why He saved us. That's why He made us a new cre- creature. That's why He's giving us His word. So that we can get that and we're going to acknowledge it. And it furnishes us. 
Go with me to Ephesians chapter 1. I think this is one of the, going to be one of the first times that I'm going to get through my notes, actually. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, where? In Christ. According as He hath chosen us, where? In Him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by who? Jesus Christ to himself, according to his good pleasure, to the, sorry, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the what? Beloved. God is before the day as you walk in them, and to do that, he has furnished us and by placing us in the called, in the predestinated, in the elect, Christ Jesus. And then, not just that, he makes us accepted. In the beloved. And that is to the praise of His glory. And now you and I could be mem- we are members of the body of Christ. That is to the praise of His glory. Not because of what we do, but because of what He has made us to be. Because that's the only way that it can be. Pleasing unto Him. We become a vessel of honor. And prepared for every good work. Go with me to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2. And it comes down to acknowledging the doctrine, acknowledging the truth of God's word. It is believing it, accepting it, and believing it to be so. Verse 19 says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are His, and that every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor, and some to what? Dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. That tells me God has already given me a position, and Christ has already sanctified me, but now what God's requiring of me is my sanctification. And the way that I do that in my, in my walk is by yielding to the truth and believing what God's Word tells me He's made me to be in Christ. Then only become I a vessel of what? <coughs> honor. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 4. And verse 1 he says, he says to the Ephesians, he says, I therefore the prison of the Lord beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. We have a job. We have a function. We have a purpose and intent why God has called us unto. And he says, I want you, I say, I, President of the Lord, beseech you. <laughs> I beseech you guys. That's gross. Be- and by the way, that beseeching is grace motivation. It's motivating. That you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. <coughs> How can we do that? How can we walk worthy? Well, if you go through the chapter in verse 22, he says, verse 22 says that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That comes through the word of God as we study the God's word, as we, as, as, we, as we meditate upon God's word, as we think upon God's word, as we read God's word, as it's working in us effectually, we're renewed in the spirit of our mind, and that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Again, God has furnished us that. He made us righteous and in holiness, and all what we need to do is do what? Put it on. 
It's like you walk in here and you got ice cold, you know, like, you know, uh, um, um, Justin Bellows was sitting out there this morning, you know, and he's like, oh, it's so cold, oh, it's so cold, you know, and he's going on. And I'm like, you don't want a jacket, Justin? Where is he? He's in there. There he sits. He's got his own jacket on now. He's got a sweater on now. Look at the guy. It's too cold inside here. I'm like, yeah, this Florida boys, I can handle this. It's nice and cool. He couldn't handle it as a guy from, from this cold area up here, you know. But he says, you know what? That problem of your coldness can go away. Just put on the jacket. Put on the new man. Walk worthy of the Lord. Walk worthy of your vocation. But be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Understand what God has made us to be. Let's get on with what God saved us unto. Let's get on with the program because it's profitable for us. Not just for us. It's profitable for all men. It's profitable for men. And when, you know, when I'm profiting by God's word and I meditate upon God's word and it profits me, you know who else is going to profit? All of you. If I'm not profiting from God's word and it's not working in me effectually, you get no profit out of it. In closing, in Philippians chapter 3, in Philippians chapter 3, That's my time. Wait, just right there. Verse 7 says, But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. All the physical attributes and everything is worked for. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Where are we going to get that from? From the Word of God, right? For whom I have suffered the loss of... By the way, and how are you going to get it? The only way you can get it from God's Word is by rightly dividing the Word of truth. You're not going to find your positional truth in Isaiah and Jeremiah and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You're going to find it in Romans through what? Philemon. We get that, right? He says, um, Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I might win Christ." And be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. The righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know Him, and the power of His resurrection, and the fellowship of His sufferings, being made conformable unto His death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. He wants to arrive at that place by any means. He wants it now. Does He want to wait? He says, if, uh, he says, verse 12 says, Not as though I have already attained. They've not arrived yet. Neither were already perfect. But I follow after. If that I may apprehend, that means to lay hold on and to comprehend, that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but there's one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I set my affection on things above and not things of the earth. My life is hit with Christ in where? In God. He says, I press toward the mark for the price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. As we come to the end of this conference... And we've, 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 we've considered the word of His grace. And we've, we've considered the grace age living. We've considered the messages preached this week. We need to go back into these passages that we've learned this week and we've looked at this week and continuously going over them. And, and, and what Paul says, I want to have it now. I want to live this life now. I know what I'm going to be made then, but I want it right now. I want to attain to it now. I want to apprehend it now. I'm no I haven't, but I want to. I press toward the mark for the price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The only way that I'm going to do it is to be careful to maintain good works. That's not my good works. It's what God has furnished me to be in Christ Jesus. It's the only way I can press toward the mark for the price is in Christ Jesus. That is our grace age service. The motivation of God's word. And at the end of the day, there is a reward. 
We all will reign with Christ eternally. The whole body of Christ. Some of us will receive more reward than others. In the body of Christ, there's vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor. In the body of Christ, they are saints and they are faithful saints. Which one are you? What is your motivation? Let the word of Christ be that motivation. Let's put it in us. Let's understand it. Let's study it. Let's consider it. Let's meditate upon it. Let's read it. Let's press on. Let's forget the things that are behind. Let us set our affection on things above. Because it's profitable for men. It's profitable for the body of Christ. If I profit and I'm edified, perfected saints do the what? Edify the body of Christ. Do the work of the ministry and it edifies the body of Christ. That's you and I. That's grace age service. God doesn't just save us and says, okay, one day you're going to have an eternal heaven. No, He's furnished us for this life here and now. And for us to understand that life here and now and what He's furnished us to, 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 to already equipped us to do through the finished work of Christ, He just wants us to now believe it, accept it, study it, know it, so that that could motivate us. <coughs> Father, we thank You for Your grace. We thank You for the complete, ultimate, complete, finished work that you've done for us through your son's work on the, cr- on the cross. Thank you for that secret, that mystery that you kept hidden yourself since the foundation of the world. Thank you for working it out now and that we can be participants of that eternal glory in the heavenly places. Thank you for your son and furnishing us in him. Thank you for your word that's not leaving us wanting but as furnishing us and fini- uh, furnishing us unto all good works and perfecting us. So we pray these things by Christ Jesus alone with thanksgiving. Amen. Thank you.